Good morning. Are you all here? Raise your hands if you're not here. Okay, okay. Are you still having fun? I will get there. Is it challenging now? Challenging enough? Okay. And what is BWSI? All right. Uh, we have a special uh, guest today. Uh, Cogworks. Can you raise your hands? All right. That's great. That's the Cogworks. Uh, so the Junhee uh, one, uh, he's the CEO of Kate, a knowledge AI technologist, and he's the uh, platinum sponsor for the Cogworks course. And of course, yeah. all of <laughs> And uh, he was also uh, generous enough to uh, give all of you a LiveScribe smart pen. Did you all receive it? Yeah. So who has used it? Who had... Okay, hope it was a good experience. All right, thank you. And so with that, uh, it is my great pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Juni Wan. He's got, he has a very interesting and radical ideas about transforming education. Let's give him a warm welcome. Uh, good morning. Before I talk about my ideas, I want to learn a little bit about you, so I'm going to ask you a few questions. Why are you here? That good, huh? No, seriously, raise your hand. Why are you here? Yep. <laughs> Me, MIT. Okay. So who else? Why are you here? Mm hmm Good. Who else? Any different ideas? Let me ask you then, why do you think BeebleWorks selected you? <laughs> okay, humility is not a virtue here, come on. Who wants to answer? You want to answer? Yeah. Define best. Define best. In terms of what? Academics? Engineering? Now, I can tell you one thing. You made the right choice. In fact, Bob created this program so that because there are no better way to learn engineering at your level and at your age. However, you have done something to get here, right? What was it? You, yeah, you completed an online program on your own, supposedly. <laughs> it took persistence and self-control. But, I fear for the wrong reasons. And this is the topic I'm going to be addressing today. Most of you probably came here either because you wanted to get into MIT or you're because your parents wanted you to go to MIT. <laughs> um, let's talk about what is the purpose of education. I'm going to show you a little video of uh, Professor Sugata Mitra, who is the creator of Soul. And we will be talking about Soul later. If you look at present day schooling the way it is, it's quite easy to figure out where it came from. It came from about 300 years ago. And it came from the last and the biggest of the empires on this planet. Imagine trying to run the show, Volume. trying to run the entire planet 
without computers, without telephones, with data handwritten on pieces of paper, and traveling by ships. But the Victorians actually did it. What they did was amazing. They created a global computer made up of people. It's still with us today. It's called the bureaucratic administrative machine. In order to have that machine running, you need lots and lots of people. They made another machine to produce those people, the school. The schools would produce the people who would then become parts of the bureaucratic administrative machine. They must be identical to each other. They must know three things. They must have good handwriting, because the data is handwritten. They must be able to read and they must be able to do multiplication, division, addition, and subtraction in their head. They must be so identical that you could pick one up from New Zealand and ship them to Canada, and he would be instantly functional. The Victorians were great engineers. They engineered a system that was so robust that it's still with us today. Continuously producing identical people for a machine that no longer exists. The empire is gone. So what are we doing with that design that produces these identical people? And what are we going to do next if we ever are going to do anything else with it? John Locke. This is the guy who designed school. It says, common man only require moral, social, and vocational knowledge. This is what MIT does, right? Vocational. However, the education of gentlemen ought to be of the very highest quality, and the gentleman must serve his country in a position of leadership. This is what they do at Harvard. So what's wrong with our schools other than the fact that it's been designed by the Victorians and, and is outdated? As we saw in the uh, uh, Professor Mitra's video, we prioritize standardization and uniformity. We try to create identical people. Everybody has to learn same level of subjects and same level of difficulty is called common core curriculum. There is an education reformist called Ken Robinson. He's a very good speaker. You'll, you'll soon meet him. He is totally against current school uh, platform. Which what these things have in common is, is that kids will take a chance. You know, if they don't know, they'll have a go. Am I right? They're not frightened of being wrong. Now, I don't mean to say that being wrong is the same thing as being creative. What we do know is, if you're not prepared to be wrong, you'll never come up with anything original. If you're not prepared to be wrong. And by the time they get to be adults, most kids have lost that capacity. Uh, they have become frightened of being wrong. And we run our companies this, by the way. We stigmatize mistakes. And we're now running national education systems where mistakes are the worst thing you can make. And the result is that we are educating people out of their creative capacities. Picasso once said this. He said that all children are born artists. The problem is to remain an artist as we grow up. I believe this passionately, that we don't grow into creativity. We grow out of it or rather we get educated out of it. His theory can be confirmed. Um, there, is a, there is a scientist called Patricia Kuehl. She studies language acquisition. We are born with highest level of uh, language acquisition ability when, since we were born to year seven. When we enter elementary school, it starts declining. When we enter middle school, it's just declining further. 
and by the time we graduate from high school, we lose it. Is this a coincidence, or is this something to do with our, our education system? Now, if you think about it, we teach. We teach breadth of knowledge, not the depth of knowledge, right? You don't learn in, until high school. You don't learn. They, when you want to know a little bit more, they say, oh, you can learn that when you go to college. Why? It's because our curriculum is designed based on Bloom's taxonomy, which was designed in 1950s. When you learn something, a formula, that's remembering stage. So they teach you a formula. A squared plus B squared equals C squared. Then you have to understand what the formula means. That's the second stage of learning. And then you should be able to apply it to solve a problem, right? That's where education stops in high school. Then you can use the formula to create a new formula, create a new equation somewhere, but you, you're allowed to do that only when you go to college and higher education. That's why it's called higher education. Lauren Schwartz, winner of Fields Medal, right? Basically a Nobel Prize in, in mathematics. He thought he was unintelligent because he was slow in mathematics. Let me read you his own words in his autobiography. I was always deeply uncertain about my own intellectual capacity. I thought I was unintelligent. It is true that I was, and still am, rather slow. I need time to see things because I always need to understand them fully. I came to the conclusion that rapidity does not have a precise relation to intelligence. What is important is to deeply understand things and their relations to each other. This is where intelligence lies. The fact of being quick or slow isn't really relevant. We do not teach students, or we do not give students enough time to be slow because we have a uniform education system. Everybody's given equal amount of time. It's highly democratic, but does not fit our intellectual mental capacity. Lastly, performance weights is based on grades. We have to have an assessment. That's how you get into MIT, right? You have to be dis differentiated from other students based on what? Your grades. That's the ultimate goal. And this is one of the reasons why we cannot do slow education, we cannot do in-depth education, we cannot do individualistic education. Angela Duckworth, the winner of 2012 MacArthur Genius Award, she said this. Here's what I found. Self-control and intelligence are only weakly correlated, and these capacities independently predict academic grades. A student score does not represent students' understanding or the mastery of the topic. If you get 70 on a test, does that mean you only understood 70% of the topic? There are a lot of other variables, right? There are a lot of other variables. Maybe you were sick that day. Maybe you got stuck on one of the questions and were not able to finish the entire test. But because of the grading system, when you get a C, you don't get into MIT, we care about those things. We, so we, instead of prioritizing understanding, we prioritize grades. Now, modern education theory is now moving away from cognitive ability to more behavioral and other factors. Now, what do you think 
is the most important factor in determining academic success. Seriously. Anybody knows? Yeah? Sleep. Hmm? Sleep? Good, yeah. Imagination. Imagination. Persistence. Uh, yep. <laughs> Very cynical, but true, yes. Yes, in the back. Work ethics. I think you have it, most of it. Um, there's a professor at Stanford called Carol Dweck. She says, gross mindset. There's a Angela Duckworth. She says, grit. She did, Angela Duckworth did a study with West Point graduates. The peop, students who had the highest grit score when they were freshmen ended up finishing with highest academic performance. And then there's this thing called metacognition, which I'll be talking about, which is very important to the future of learning. Carol Dweck's gross mindset is an important theory. It sounds so basic. So you, I, when I first read it, I said, what is so great about this? But more and more I, th I think about it, this really makes sense. She defines the world into two categories, people with fixed mindsets and people with gross mindsets. People with fixed mindset are usually smart students, like yourselves. Because you get fixated and on the achievement and the result. It's very difficult to do, accept failures and try to learn from the failures. That's what fixed versus gross mindset is. There is a great book uh, with the same title, so go read it. There is a study done by University of Chicago says the highest correlation between young children and the uh, academic performance in the later years is actually discipline. The kids who did all the homework, the kids who went to school every day and never skipped to school tend to do better. Angela Duckworth, great. And there is a big charter school called KIPP. They try to train students with seven character traits, optimism, self-control, gratitude, so on and so on. Moving away from cognitive ability to behavioral and psychological is the latest trend. Now, here comes metacognition theory. Metacognition theory basically means thinking about thinking, knowing what you know and knowing what you do not know. Anybody heard about metacognition theory? OK, one person. Wow, you guys are really engineering people. <laughs> OK, here we go. You have 30 minutes left for a very important exam, and you have to ace it. How would you spend the rest of the time studying? Those who think reading or reviewing the material is more effective, raise your hand. About half. And that group is, uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, you, you guys don't believe in that. Practice tests. About half and half. The metacognition theory says, and there was study done, in fact, this is a very unusual group. I think you're just guessing what the answer is <laughs> on a contrarian thing. 90% of the students choose to review materials rather than practice tests. And that's because our human nature is we do not like realizing things that we do not no, when we read, we think we understand. But when you do the testing and assessments and monitoring, then it is uncomfortable by human nature. Unless you're a genius and you know, ace every test you ever took. So practice test is a better way of learning than reading and review. So next time you have to take a test, 
use more practice tests. There are three stages of metacognition learning. Planning. Planning. Have you noticed that students who are not good students, they spend a lot of time cleaning their desk before they study. And then what they do is they start with the, with the subject they're, they're good at. And leave the, the most difficult subject, the weakest subject, to the last. And as a result, they spend less time studying for the subject they need more than the subject they're already good at. That's planning is important. And then you have to know whether you really understand or you, th you think you understand. So you have to do the monitoring and assessment. And then you have to evaluate the whole uh, process of learning, whether you're doing it right. This is critical process for the future of learning. So we'll come back to this metacognition theory. Now, all this changing. What do you think is the largest school or largest educational institution in the world? Khan Academy. Khan Academy. Yeah, who, who said YouTube? <laughs> You're right. The internet. In particular, is the YouTube. In fact, kids learn how to play chess in YouTube, right? Yeah. Kids learn how to do magic on YouTube. They even learn how to play guitar on YouTube. And then what happens? You think you're good, but objectively speaking, you're not that good, but you don't know you're not that good. <laughs> there is a paradigm shift. Standardization and uniformity is no longer the goal of education. Why? Because the Victorian education was designed to teach you knowledge, the vocational knowledge, to, for you to execute the, the calculations and the writings and, and documentations, right? So teachers were conveyors of knowledge. But we have the internet now. We have the Wikipedias. We have the YouTubes. So why do you have to learn knowledge from teachers? You can just look it up, Google. So for the first time in history, we can now dream about an efficient education. Herbert Simon, who won Nobel Prize, cognitive scientist, said, learning results from what the student does and thinks, and only from what the student does and thinks. Teacher can advance learning only by influencing what the student does to learn. In other words, it's up to you. Learning is no longer about memorization and understanding and only learning from teachers, but it's actually you have the ability to learn. And if you do more, you can do better. This is why you are so lucky to be here because you're actually doing things. Project-based learning, collaborative learning, right? This is what Beaverwork is designed for. That's how you learn. That's how you learn in-depth knowledge, not from the books or the internet. Finland used to be the darling of world's education, right? All the US media talked about how great Finland was. In fact, Finland started education reform in 1968. They started teacher reform in 1974. And then they aced PISA exam. PISA exam are, is, is program for international student assessment. Basically, 70 OECD countries take the same exam for all their students, and they get ranking, which is a fixed mindset, but you know, ranking is very important, so one to two. And Finland was number one between 2000 to 2009. This exam is given every three years. And then they did something. And look how the Finland score went down. So what do you think happened? 
Finland did not sit on their laurels and they changed the program. So they gave up on getting number one ranking in PISA scores. This is what they did. Finland school, subject scrapped and replaced with topics. So what do they do now? They do something called phenomenon teaching. So they teach cafeteria services and they teach language, foreign language. They teach mathematics. They teach communication skills. More topical project-based learning. And Finland has already done that in 2016, implemented in 2015. So the future of school, as we can see from Finland's case, and there are a lot of schools moving to this direction, is self-directed project-based learning. The curriculum is creativity-oriented curriculum. And we try to do personalized and differentiated learning. And the teachers' roles are changing. Teachers' roles are now becoming coaches and guides rather than actually trying to teach you anything. And the grades and standardized tests are no longer important. When I went to school, SAT's grades were much more important. Nowadays, they don't look at SAT score as long as you do fairly well, like perfect score, then they don't care. <laughs> Sugata Mitra, you know the first uh, professor who talked about Victorian England and the school origination, original uh, school days? He got this idea from watching movie 2001 Space Odyssey. So he actually put computers in Mumbai, oh, New Delhi, sorry, New Delhi, in the slum areas of New Delhi in English. These kids have never seen computers before, and they don't speak English. But within a few weeks, he realized students, the kids on the street are using Google and using and learning without anyone teaching them. So he came up with this thing called self-organized learning environment. Basically, is technology computers, internet, plus collaboration, like what you're doing here, right? And teachers, what do they do? He hired retired teachers, and they, he told her, she told them to just say, oh, you're doing a good job, just like kindergarten teachers, right? Whatever you do, you pee in your pants, they, they say, oh, you did a good job. <laughs> Self-directed learning methodology, this is where metacognition theory comes back in. You need targeted feedback, and you need, because you don't know how well you're learning, you need to do the monitoring and adjustments, and you need assessment using technology. When you have stomach ache, then what do you do? You go to the doctor. And what does the doctor do? They give you tests. And they try to find out whether you have indigestion, ulcer, or stomach cancer, right? All the way to stomach cancer. But if you do badly and you fail a test, what does the teacher do? They give you more tests. It's like giving you Zantac for every problem you have. The medical industry has already adapted very comprehensive diagnostics. But the education industry hasn't, did not adapt that. And we are still caught up in scores. A's and B's and C's, mostly A's, versus really understanding the subject. So we need, in education, precise diagnostics, just like the medical, right? The doctors have an MRI, CT scan, x-rays, and what do we have? Tests. Let me tell you four 
important um, self-learning strategies. And this self-learning is really important because when you get out of school, when you graduate from MIT, then nobody will teach you. You're on your own. You have to learn everything on your own. So cultivating the self-learning ability is so important. And let me start with my own experience. I went to high school here, and I wanted to get in. I had a fixed mindset, so I wanted to get into good school, so I took AP English. My first class in AP English was King Lear, Shakespeare. And we were reading King Lear. And I thought we were going to read chapter one. My teacher said, oh, read the whole book by next week. So I did. Took me like four hours and only got through half of it because I was looking up all the archaic words that we never use anymore. Then it dawned on me, hey, this is a play. How many plays last more than two hours? So I ran to the library, and we, at, you know, I'm quite old, so we did not have DVDs and all these things, MP3s. I took out cassette tape, so I played cassette tape and read along. Oh, little did I know. You know the actors, they uh, on stage, they do exactly what Shakespeare wrote. So, and it really, I finished reading in two hours. It helped my understanding considerably. There is Jewish teaching methodology called Habruta. Two students, when they study Talmud, when they, they try to explain to each other. Harvard Business School, HBS, used this same concept in case studies. Talking and explaining to other person actually makes you learn. In fact, makes you learn better. So it's actually a good idea to have a dumb student in your, in your group because you can explain to that student. And while you're explaining, you're learning better. <laughs> so those. <laughs> now, let, the third method. Third method. Let me read you this. He studied and nearly mastered six books of Euclid since he was a member of Congress. He began a course of rigid mental discipline with the intent to prove his faculties, especially his powers of logic and language, hence his fondness for Euclid. Who do you think this person is? If you say Donald Trump, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> Any guess? Obama? Abraham Lincoln. He was self-taught. He used Euclid elements to learn how to do litigation, to learn how to, how to convey logic. Did you, you guys all read Euclid, right? <laughs> Just a little bit. Passages when you learned in school. Go you read Euclid. In fact, it's uh, probably the best book to teach you logic, which is more relevant than calculus that you're doing right now. Stephen Jay Gould. Does anybody know who Stephen Jay Gould is? Another MacArthur Genius Award winner? professor of Harvard uh, University. He's the guy who wrote Panda's Thumb. It looks like Panda has six fingers, but he has, Panda actually has a little thumb protruding out of his, uh, so it's not a thumb, it's, but it's, it's not a finger, but it's, uh, it's the way the panda evolved to try to climb trees better. He says, my talent is making connections. Can you see a pattern? I always see a pattern in this forest. When you read, don't stop reading and try to understand, as Bloom's taxonomy tell you to do. You have to make connections. You have to make connections. 
Just like Lincoln did, made connections with Euclid and law, and logic, and litigation, and political debates, you can actually, don't stop there, think about expanding your newly acquired knowledge through making connections. Let me go back to uh, Ken Robinson. And this is a really moving story, especially about the millionaire part. I, I think you like it. Gillian Lynn. Have you heard of her? Some have. She's a choreographer, and everybody knows her work. She did Cats and Phantom of the Opera. She's wonderful. I used to be on the board of the Royal Ballet in England, as you can see. <laughs> and uh, anyway, Gillian and I had lunch one day. I said, how'd you get to be a dancer? And she said it was interesting. When she was at school, she was really hopeless. And the school in the 30s wrote to her parents and said, we think Gillian has a learning disorder. You couldn't concentrate. She was fidgeting. I think now they'd say she had ADHD. Wouldn't you? But this was the 1930s, and ADHD hadn't been invented you know, at this point. So it <laughs> wasn't an available condition. You know, people, <laughs> people, <laughs> people weren't aware they could have that. No way at all. Anyway, she sent, went to see this, um, this specialist. So this oak panel room, and, and she was there with, uh, with her mother, and she was led and sat on this uh, chair at the end, and she sat on her hands for 20 minutes while this man talked to her mother about all the problems Gillian was having at school. And at the end of it, um, because she was disturbing people, her homework was always late and so on, little kid of eight, in the end, uh, the, uh, the doctor went and sat next to Gillian and said, Gillian, I've listened to all these things that your mother's told me. I need to speak to her privately. So she said, he, he said wait here, we'll be back. We won't be very long. And, and, uh, and they went and left her. But as they went out the room, he turned on the radio that was sitting on his desk. And when they got out the room, he said to her mother, just stand and watch her. And um, the minute they left the room, she said she was on her feet, moving to the music. And they watched for a few minutes, and he turned to her mother, and he said, you know, Mrs. Lynn, Gillian isn't sick. She's a dancer. <laughs> Take her to a dance school. I said, what happened? He said, she did. I can't tell you so how wonderful it was. We walked in this room, and it was full of people like me. People who couldn't sit still. People who had to move to think. Who had to move to think. They did ballet, they did tap, they did jazz, they did modern, they did contemporary. She was eventually auditioned for the Royal Ballet School. She became a soloist. She had a wonderful career at the Royal Ballet. She eventually graduated from the Royal Ballet School, found, found her own company, the Julian Dance Company, met Andrew Lloyd Webber. She's been responsible for some of the most successful musical theatre productions in history. She's given pleasure to millions, and she's a multimillionaire. Somebody else might have put her on medication and told her to calm down. <laughs> now, I think... So, in conclusion, teachers do not rely on teachers as conveyors of knowledge. There will be AI, artificial intelligence-based teaching assistants, and there will be technology-based self-monitoring assessment tools, and you can do the learning by yourself at your own pace, and there will be specialized schools for collaboration. Now, all these specialized schools for math and science, Bronx science, <laughs> are already there. <laughs> There should be that more dance schools, and they, you know, students should be allowed to go to these schools instead of going through common core curriculum that everybody has to take and take SATs and get 300 on it. Why now? And I'm going to read this because I want to get the message right. Because there is availability of technology. Because it is in our innate nature, we are born with innate ability to learn. Because human beings evolved since the Industrial Revolution days, and we become more diversified and more individualistic. Do not restrict yourself to learning knowledge from school. You can learn much more by going to Beaverworks and in depth on your own. Do not have fixed mindset and think your life depends on getting A's and perfect score in SATs. When I was a student, I worked as a volunteer at Harvard admissions office. 
back then at least, and I can tell you that admissions is not precise science. If they say that, that's, that's a lie. I think it's more based on intuition of the officers rather than science. And they cannot really explain why they want this student. I just like them. I heard so many stories. I like him. I like her. And that's why they call it the arts. Do not try to stack your extracurricular activities with something that you are not passionate about just to put it on your college application. Bad news, guys. Beaverworks is not going to get you into MIT. <laughs> Please go change the way we teach and learn. Do not be afraid of the unknown, unfamiliar, and making mistakes. Einstein said, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. Go change your mindset and awaken your inner ability to learn on your own. Do not rely on schools or teachers, and then go change the world. Thank you. Oh, I have fixed mindset, guys. Uh, easy questions only, please. <laughs> Any questions? Yeah. Yeah. No. Like yeah. Like <laughs> Sorry. No, it's okay. It's okay. Take your time. Yes, yes. Um, technology can be used to give you knowledge, to make assessment of your understanding, but it cannot replace teachers. Absolutely not. But one thing it can do is if you, are a, if you have a curious mind, if you want to ask 10,000 questions and there are 30 students in the class, and you can only ask two questions, and they'll tell you to shut up. Now, <laughs> if you have AI technology who, which has your records and, you do know, and your data and knows you, knows you, and they do not tire and they do not have office hours, then you can ask all the questions you want. And the AI technology can monitor because it, can, it has this, the, your data, it can monitor the answers and, and your questions and give you the appropriate level of answers. The technology is already out there. It's being you. I mean, hey, even Uber is making self-driving cars, OK, using AI. It's just that we did not adapt this technology in education because we are afraid. Okay, that was a good question. Yep. So I'm wondering if, in a world where there are no grades or no standardized tests, if you're thinking about like, evaluating a high school student, what can you really determine? What, what, what can you do to determine who would deserve to go to a, a top university or, or who's the most capable or who's the best student? You know, what is your name? Rob. Okay. I will make sure I'll send you a book on fixed mindset and growth mindset. Um, you're right. In fact, the biggest fixed mindset is universities, MIT, Harvard, OK? They try to find the best students. But do they really? Do they really? 
When I worked at Harvard admissions office, I worked at a Harvard HBS, business school admissions office. They actually, instead of trying to get the best score, perfect 4.0 GPA, perfect SAT score, and you know, 200 pages extracurricular activities, they try to find people who are more likely to succeed in their, in their lives. Why? Because if you're successful, they give you more money. And Harvard Business School, among rich Harvard schools, has the biggest endowment fund. Now, do you think, do you really think Zuckerberg had a perfect score or perfect grades? He did get into Harvard, but he didn't finish Harvard. Do you think Bill Gates had a perfect score and perfect grades? Do not get caught up in, in grades and extracurricular activities only. There is a student from Brazil. He, learned, he taught himself how to do computer programming, and then he taught other Brazilian students by opening an online program to teach programming. He applied to Harvard. And I am sure, because he spent too much time doing programming, his grades were not that good, but he got in. It's not easy. I, like I said, this is not easy, right? We cannot give up grades and, and extracurricular activities and, and stuffing resumes and stuffing college applications. But there are other ways to do it, and there are more satisfying ways to do it, just like Steve Jobs said at Stanford graduation speech. Have a passion and, and dream big. Getting into MIT is not the goal. The goal is surviving in MIT after you get in, <laughs> then getting a job, and getting a good paying job, and then succeeding, right? So MIT is just a step. Think big. Any other questions, or are you just uh, yawning? Yeah. Um, it's already happening. There are many schools springing up all over the world, right, with uh, specialized education schools, and it's going to take years. Like I said, Finland started reform, education reform in 1968, and then by 2000, they really knew how to do it. It's going to take years. At least it will not apply to you. However, it will apply to your children. The point here is do not try to come to MIT to learn engineering, to get degrees, you know, masters, PhDs. That's not the point. The point is you have to be able to cultivate this self-learning ability so you can actually, instead of relying on others to teach you, you can learn on your own. And I hope BibleWorks does that. Bob told me, tell me if it's wrong, um, Bob told me he founded this program because there, is, there are no other ways, no other people are doing similar program to teach engineering. The fact that you're sitting here it already means that education is changing. Already people are realizing how important project-based learning is, collaboration learning is, self-learning is, right? Rather than taking an engineering 101 at some college, Caltech summer school, which I'm sure you have all done that too. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah? Yeah, <laughs> like you. Where are you from? I'm from Korea. Yep, welcome, me too. <laughs> the fixed mindset country, the entire country in Asian countries are fixed mindset. They're so exam score driven, right? 
They still go to school based on college entrance exams. Not just Korea, Korea, China, Japan, everywhere. everywhere. Yes, it's not going to change. The system will not change on its own unless when you graduate, when you go out in the world and you start thinking about what I said today and start changing, little bit by little bit. This is not a bloody revolution, I, although I wish it was, but <laughs> it's going to be, it's going to be, you know, evolution. But I have to start somewhere, and Bob is starting somewhere, I'm starting somewhere, I'm trying to do, make the education system evolve into something more appropriate for this, this day and age. Last question? Yep. Yes, yes. In fact, um, we're doing the AI, and uh, um, state uh, education director of CS, CBSE came to us and said, oh, we have 60 million students. Can, you, uh, can we use your program? I said, yes. Well, can you pay? Then he said, no. So I said, please wait. Um, yes, you're right. It is. Not that easy. But that doesn't mean, well, computers, when it first came out, was too expensive. Nobody was able to afford them, right? But now, everybody has one. Everybody has laptops, Apple, everything. So, you know, with time, the technology, the pricing of the technology is going to come down as well. You know why? AI program is expensive because AI scientists are expensive. So in high, so high demand. By the way, guys, those of you who want to make a lot of money, go study AI at MIT. <laughs> You'll get five job offers. So with time, I think it will come down. And also, go make, go start up a company and make a billion dollar company and donate a lot of money to education. Education changes people. Education changes lives, OK? Instead of giving them food and clothing, I would rather give them education, provided you don't die. <laughs> but it's a critical, in fact, that's why Bill Gates Foundation is so interested in education. I mean, that's how you change a country. And fundamental lives of people. OK, maybe, I guess that's maybe, it. Uh, 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 maybe one last question? Just one more. Time for one Yo. more. Oh, how much time do I have, Bob? <laughs> now, here. Here's the thing. Um, in elementary school, you know what's the most important subject that you have to do? <laughs> if you talk to tiger moms, it's like violin or piano, right? <laughs> no, it's physical education, PE. I know you, you engineering types don't like PE, <laughs> but it is. In, in elementary school, the more you do physical exercise, your brain develops better. And then, then is, is arts and music. Not to put on your resumes and not to put on your college applications. You don't have to become a violinist for San Francisco Chamber Orchestra. It's really for your own good. And the tiger moms are not wrong. Their motivation and the goal is different, is wrong, but because they trained kids with art and music, they do develop better. Yes, absolutely. And 
So if you want to major in art, and then you say, oh, but that's not AI. I cannot get a job with art. <laughs> not really, if you think about it. Airbnb founders, which school did they go to? MIT? Rhode Island School of Design. Uber founder, which school did he go to? UCLA, not, not MIT, not Harvard. Yeah, it's Zuckerberg's and Bill Gates are uh, twisting your mind. Think. <laughs> really, there are many, many ways you can make money. It doesn't matter what you study. Study what you want to study. Don't study just to get into MIT, because if you Flunk at MIT is worse than going to another school and doing better. Just do the things that you want to do, including art and music. Okay, thank you guys. Bye. <laughs>